congratulations to the chess kid prodigy Tani Adelume on his second international master norm. I want to show you how he beat a top level chess player, a master by one move. Now, if you've watched my video on Chess Kid called Winning Endgame Transitions, well, that's gonna help you a lot today. Take a look at our chessboard. We're not in the endgame yet. We've still got a middle game going on and a lot of forced moves are about to happen. Now, Tani's a great attacker and he begins with Rook F1 and there's a lot of damage happening. The bishop's in danger, the queen peekaboo on that queen. Tani's gonna do something bad to black. So, black decided to offer a trade of queens. Now, we have a very long sequence coming up. Tani traded queens and seemingly won a piece. Two minor pieces in chess are almost always better than the rook. But now Tani has the tables turned on him by this move rook f8. Oh no, the knight is in double trouble. And if the knight moves anywhere, it cannot possibly guard the rook behind it. So it looks like the knight is just lost. Ah, but a check. A check sometimes saves the day. We're still getting to that key moment. So bear with me because you're gonna see what a razor thin difference it is between a win and a draw, or sometimes even a loss in the end game. Okay, now the king comes up to attack the knight, our knight's in danger, and so is our rook. So the rook's trade, the knight still needs some sort of help, so the knight runs away to pretty much its only available square. But then the rook forks the knight and the bishop. There's not a whole lot Tani can do here except to give another check. And then surprisingly, the black king walks toward the knight. The knight is now double attacked and the bishop is in danger. And you can't very well play a move like bishop to c2 because you'll actually lose the game after rook f1. You'll actually have to put your bishop in the way and you'll be down a rook for a knight. So what does Tani do? He moves up and he guards the bishop. But then black says, wait, now I have a chance to get rid of my rook and get your two minor pieces. So the rook takes, and this is, I submit to you, dear YouTube viewer, the key moment. He needs to figure out what to do in this position. And I'm gonna tell you, the most obvious move is the wrong move. In this position, whenever you're pinning a piece like this, you don't feel the need to capture right away. Or maybe you do feel that need. I want you to suppress that feeling. And I want you to understand, you don't have to take the rook on the very next move. In fact, this is that difference between a win and a loss. If you capture the rook, you're losing. But if you make another improvement move with your king, you are winning. Let's first take a look at the wrong path, which Tani did not do. If he had captured the rook, then the king would have captured, and of course, black's king is much more advanced than white's. Now, white's king can run up the board, but when the king chases the pawn and white's king moves over, black can run white out of moves by just playing a move like h5. Now, sure, white could make a move like b3, but then after the move king to e4, white is officially out of moves to guard the pawn. Now, white can chase this a pawn, but after takes, king takes king here, uh-oh, the white king is pinned to the side of the board and the black pawn just dances down the board. Tani would go from a win to a loss. So we need to go all the way back. And this one little difference is what it takes to win chess games. Tani did not take the rook. He played king to b3 and black has to burn a move to get out of the pin. Black played king f6 because what else are you gonna do to get out of the pin? Now Tani took and look at the difference this little king move makes. Now his king comes up to a4. And if black chases the pawn, it's actually really easy to win. Now when you take, you get a second pawn and Tani will just come back to block the D pawn and his two outside pass pawns are actually very easily winning. They can even guard themselves in certain positions. So Black decided, you know what? Can't just play king over after takes because well, it's just too obvious. I just showed you how Black is gonna lose the game. So the king comes to the square G4. Now the funny thing is we have to do a lot of very exact calculation. My coach taught me growing up when you get involved in a pawn race to actually count using your fingers. Now, it doesn't look very professional when you're doing this in an over the board chess game, but I'm gonna make the moves. I'm gonna be a little bit nicer to YouTube land. If Tani had captured, this is a win. However, after takes, takes, and the king moves, it turns out that both sides queen at the same time. Tani would actually prefer his pawn to not be there so that when he promotes first, his queen would be guarding the h1 square. So I'm gonna push all these pawns, keep it going. It's almost like the ending to that movie Searching for Bobby Fischer, but unfortunately this pawn is in the way. Now this is a winning end game, but if you've seen any of my YouTube videos or any of my regular videos on Chess Kid, you know that queen end games are the hardest to win. So we're gonna hit the giant reverse button. We're gonna go all the way back and Tani found a beautiful 
way to win. Instead of playing king takes, he played king to b5. And let me show you why this is different. Now after takes, he wins the d-pawn. Why is it better to win the d-pawn? Well, he gets his own king to the perfect square. Notice in this position, you might think, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll move my king here or here or here. You actually really don't want to go there because black's pawn will promote with a checking diagonal. Okay, but it turns out this is the most accurate move by far. And you're thinking, but, but Fun Master Mike, we're still gonna end up getting into a queen endgame. And you told me those were hard to win. Well, yeah, but there's exceptions to everything. If you can find a forcing sequence in this position to get the queens off the board, uh, white will win easily because white's king is just closer. And Tani would win the game with the move queen check and there are no good moves for black. If the king moves here, notice he can't go here or here. That's why Tani put his king on e5. If the king moves here, then Tani's queen would go to one of these two squares on the diagonal. Let's just pick one because that one looks kind of neat. And we would skewer the king and the queen. It is the longest diagonal I can ever draw on the chessboard. We win the black queen. And of course, black's king could move here, but now we simply trade queens, which is just as effective because after the trade, black's king could not be on a worse square. The white king would simply mosey on over win both pawns and win the game. So black actually resigned in this position, already realizing what would happen after king to e5. White's would, pawn would promote first and the queen trade would result in a winning king and pawn endgame. I hope you appreciate how exact you have to be to beat one of the world's top players as Tani just did, but congratulations to him. This was one of his seven points en route to his second international master norm. We hope he goes on to get that international master title soon, and then it'll be on to the grandmaster title. Congratulations, Tani. Welcome to my world. Time to attack! A knight on the rim is grim. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Bye. <laughs>